Hi, boys and girls, and welcome back to the Carl and Crappy Show. We have reached the uh, point of the season where I lose track of what week it is. I think, I think, Carl, it's week four. Is that right? It's week number four. Yes, it is. I should just look. I should just look at what you're doing there because you're desperately trying fourth to quarter. help me. Because fourth, fourth yeah, we're done. Four. We're almost done. Almost done. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> we're almost. We're almost. We're almost getting to the really good stuff. Is what is what is almost ready to happen here. Um, how you doing? Oh, not too bad. We, we we're back in summer mode here in uh, in Nashville. We had that nice little taste of fall, and now it's you know it's still eighty seven outside right now, and it's well after dark and way too hot. So I'm I, we're we're back in summer mode in Pittsburgh too, and I just I, I'm I'm so over it. Uh, the the AC has been on for several days. I'm like it's like eh, no, come on. Yeah, um, I'm with you. Uh, but we're almost to October, and that's that's when the, of course the uh, the real uh, fun college football. Uh, begins. Although there's good stuff this weekend, um, but before we get to this weekend, let's get to discuss last weekend. Um, what, what what did you learn on Saturday that you did not know before? Well, I I, I didn't make it to Pac-12 after dark. I tried real hard. Uh, yeah, I did. I tried real real hard, but I didn't make it. Um, so I made it to Pac-12 almost after dark, um, which was the USC Texas game, which okay, you know, which was an interesting thing because it. I mean, it's a rematch of one of the best games in college football history. Mm -hmm. And it kind of flew under the radar a little bit on the national landscape um, because Texas was so abysmal in the early part of the season. Um, and that really didn't change much in that mm -hmm. game. In fact, it was really funny. Fox, the um, color commentator for, um, for Fox on that broadcast with Gus Johnson, uh, Joel Klatt, made the statement in the fourth quarter of that game that Texas was abysmal until it, until it was absolutely desperate. Like it had to get in like okay. that desperate situation yeah. of like third and eleven and needing twelve to keep the game going mm -hmm. that it would actually do something on offense. It was just one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Um, but my takeaway from that game, couple things. First thing was, um, holy cow, USC offense, which we kind of knew, right? I mean, we've known that since the Rose Bowl last year right. and, and the whole bit. Um, but forty-five seconds is too much time to leave uh, Clay Helton's offense on the field. Um, with Sam Darnold. I mean, it was like nothing, right? 45 yeah. seconds, he went yeah. down the field. They needed bum, a field bum, bum, to bum, tie bum. the game, and it was, yeah, clockwork. Boom, 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 boom. And then it, my hero of the week is USC walk-on kicker J Chase McGrath. I mean, for his first career field goal to come as a, as a game, to tie the game to send it to overtime, mm -hmm. and his second career field goal from the same distance, same hash mark that he had missed earlier in the game is the game winner in double <laughs> overtime. I mean, yes. Kudos to that kid. I hope he lived it up on campus this week. Um, but that was a heck of a football game that kind of fell off of the national landscape. But after Clemson was, you know, beating the heck out of Louisville, which we kind of expected was going to happen, but it yeah. started even earlier than I, even I was thinking, um, we pretty much just left it on USC Texas because that game was the most entertaining of any of them, which is kind of shocking, and we didn't talk about that game. Um, but USC – Offense is still ridiculous. Obviously, on defense, they still have some things to figure out because uh, this is a bad Texas team offensively. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that they were letting a desperate Texas offense figure out a way to make these long plays to be able to extend the game and almost win the darn thing um, in their stadium, I, I think I think if you're a USC fan, you're thrilled that you got the win um, and it kind of avenged that national title game and there was you know all the – past players were there. I think that was one of the coolest things um, was USC scored. And I don't remember who caught the ball, but went over and high five Matt Leinert, who just happened to be down there for Fox. Right. Um, so like, it, it, so that was kind of a, like the cool things that Vince Young was there, you know, it was like, it was a big deal. Um, so it was cool for USC, but I think if I'm a USC fan, I'm a little bit nervous about that defense and whether or not the offense is going to be able to carry the, the team the rest of the year. Um, you know, we'll see what happens when they play Washington. So that was that was my takeaway. What was yours? Um. Well, uh, there are a number of things. Uh, I learned that it, it sucks to go to a, a, a tailgate to run a tailgate party and uh, go to a college football game when you have a cold. Um, yeah. But but you know, and I also learned that it's it's possible to comfortably take a nap in the back seat of my my parents' SUV. Um, okay. So which I which I did for about an hour in the middle of the tail tailgate party. That that worked out okay. Um, and fortunately, you know, Ohio State games was uh, Ohio State's game against uh, Army was such that uh, we were we we left a little bit early and, and um, you know went back and, and got to the air conditioning. And I felt better after that. Um, 
And the, the other thing, another thing that I learned uh, that I didn't, I can't say that I didn't know this already, but uh, God damn it, Ohio State fans. Um, I just, I, I saw people actually, Ohio State fans heckling other Ohio State fans for wearing JT Barrett jerseys. And um, this, this made, this, this is irritating um, because uh, JT Barrett is going to own every significant, um, with the exception of straight out rushing, uh, records. He's going to know every signif own every significant offensive record in Ohio State football um, by the time he's done at the end of this season. Um, and his, you know his 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 uh, one loss record. I think he's lost four now. Um, you know it's it's over over the three and a half seasons. It's it's, it's ridiculous, and uh, the way he is treated is obnoxious. So I I am wearing I am wearing JT Barrett jerseys, period for the rest of the season. That's. That is my vow um, as an Ohio State fan, and um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to come out on top on this one. I think it's, it's going to work out well. Um, the other thing the other thing I, I learned is that I probably shouldn't um, be quite as cocky when I suspect there's a, a really ugly SEC game coming up because I I think I picked I said the score for uh, Florida Tennessee was going to be something like nine to six. Uh, something like that, and I, I was wrong, boy, about that well, one, huh? But it was, but it was six three at the half. I was right for a half. Yeah, <laughs> like it was one of those, like we were we were out. We decided we were going to skip the first half of the game and come back and watch the second half mm -hmm. of the game. And we were listening to it on the radio, and um, Florida was up six three at the half, and Tennessee had the chance to tie it with like two seconds to go before that before the half, and, and yeah. missed the field goal. Um, and we both just kind of bemoaned. We're like, "Yeah, this is a great game." Um, and then came back, and it was one of those. And that's and that's. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. talk about nine seconds of complete polar opposites in the same stadium. With nine seconds left to play, people were questioning the fans in, in the swamp were questioning Jim McElwain's clock management and why wasn't he calling a timeout or why weren't they running out of bounds and like all this. Um, the fans were booing. The, the, the Florida offense was being booed off the field with one play left, which ended up being the Hail Mary that which won was, the game. So they, were, was, so they went from booing into complete celebration mode. And, okay, so, so they won the game on the Hail Mary. That's still just their second offensive touchdown on the season. That, that is a like, problem. That is a problem. Yes. <laughs> but just like that, yeah. Then that nine seconds was just some of the most bizarre like atmosphere I've ever seen on TV, um, and probably just saved Jim McElwain's job for at least another few weeks, mm -hmm. um, because I think there there would have been some some definite um, murmurs along yes. those lines of what's going on here. But um, Jeff Brom, new head coach of the Florida Gators, um, that's. <laughs> um, <laughs> You, you, you know, it, it, th but yeah, that was that was bizarre. That was absolutely bizarre. And the fact that now that game two years in a row has ended on a hill, Mary, with True. opposite teams like True. SEC, man, that's <laughs> it's it awful is, until it isn't. It is what they do. That is what they do. Um, the, the other thing that came up uh, last week um, that I want to make sure uh, we we, uh, we we come back to. We we sort of um, we, we joked about the fact that neither of us, me especially. Not staying up for Pac-12 after dark. I'm nope. I'm 50 years old, and I, it's like no, I'm not I'm not staying up that late because I'm I'm old and I'm tired. Um, and we uh, we uh, we nominated our friend AJ Kuftik, who's a, a friend of the show, longtime fan of the show, been on the show a few times uh, to be and 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 younger than than we are, and and we <laughs> nominated him to be our Pac-12 after dark uh, Carla and Crappy Show official correspondent. AJ came through. With yes, previews of not one but two games, uh, UCLA at Stanford and number seven Washington at Colorado. Um, AJ, take it away. Uh, hey everybody, it's uh, your boy AJ, uh, the official Pac-12 After Dark uh, reporter for the Carla and Crappy Show. Uh, we got a fun one this week. It's UCLA Stanford week. Uh, that is on ten. That is on at ten thirty. Your ESPN Pac-12 After Dark game of the week. Uh, there's a lot of throwing from UCLA, so just you know, get yourself a cup of coffee at the first quarter. Uh, last week featured a whole bunch of fun. Stanford lost to San Diego State. That's a thing. Put that in. Put put that uh, put that on a on a pad of paper. 
write that down, stare at it for a while, and understand that, that actually happened after the lights went out. Uh, so we got we got Stanford coming off of a loss to an underdog, which means them nerves are going to be hidden, just hidden people real hard. Uh, Josh Rosen will also throw for a billion yards. Uh, Sam Darnold had a lot of fun with the Stanford team. Uh, so I'm going to take a guess that Josh Rosen's going to take his sweet, sweet time and pick apart this Stanford defense. Uh, this is a super fun game. If we're also taking a look at that schedule, we've got Washington, Colorado. That's got that's got some upset potential. That is in Boulder. Do not sleep on Boulder. It's not. I don't know if it qualifies as official Pac-12 after dark because it is a 10 o'clock kickoff and not a 10:30 kickoff. But we'll take it. And uh, we got Arizona and or Arizona State uh, hosting Oregon. And so. Yeah, no, Oregon's going to absolutely destroy them. The over-under on that game is 75. So buckle up, kids. That one's going to get pointy. I highly recommend watching all three. Stay up for Pac-12 After Dark. Give up on the noon slate if you have to. There's nothing on at noon. It doesn't matter. I'm not even looking at the schedule. Give up on the noon slate and just stick around at 1030 with me. Uh, It's AJ, Pac-12 After Dark. Watch it. I, you know, in two minutes, I, I don't know that I could even come close to, to a, a better way of wrapping up uh, not one, but but two football games. Do you have, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, no, no. Th- thanks, AJ. Um, no, but the the only yes. other thing that I would yes. add is I think he's got a I think he's got a great take on that UCLA Stanford game. Um, in the fact that, that what happened to Stanford? I I mean, two weeks ago we were just talking about them and thinking that they had a shot of of winning the Pac-12 South and. Yeah. I mean, they they got leveled by USC, and then I mean, last week is a stunner. To be perfectly honest, now now true that game was ridiculous because the power went out randomly for twenty five minutes. Uh, sure, sure. Um, but still, Stanford should not be losing to San Diego State. Um, so yeah, that UCLA, and that UCLA offense when it's on has the potential of putting up a bunch of points, and it, you know Josh Rosen has proven that he can do it. He came, to, but you know that that was the big game from week one of the big games from week one when he brought that team back. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, AJ, thank you. Um, and I think I think UCLA is a good pick. Uh, UCLA is a good pick. And, 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 you know, who knows? Uh, uh, Boulder is one of those those uh, quirky, weird places. Um, it is. And, and, you know, if, if, if the Buffaloes are able to, to slow down Washington at all, that's, that, that would be one to pay attention to. That would be so, sneaky good. So, um, AJ, we appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. And, well, at some point, we'll get you actually – on the show so you can you can talk with us about what we're missing because we can't stay up late um <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, we have uh, other games to talk about um and we're going to start uh this is really the, the 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 first time digging into a lot of conference games and uh there's the pack uh, excuse me the the big 12 has a good one to, to get started with uh, number 16 tcu at Number six, Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State is favored by 11 after smoking uh, Pitt here uh, in, in my current hometown by about 60 or 70 points last weekend. <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you think about this one? Yeah, both of these teams have offenses that are absolutely ridiculous in the early part of the year. Right. Um, if you combine their total yards of offense after the first three games, it's 1,100 yards per game. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, just ridiculous offensive numbers. So this is going to be one of those. I looked, the over-under in this game is 71 and a half. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that's enough. I think that's another take the over, I think. Um, <laughs> should, yeah, should, there, should we be playing this one after dark, you think? Should that be should that be a thing? Big maybe 12 just, after dark? Yeah, is, is there th- but it's playing play at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah. I eh, – <laughs> big 12 afternoon? There we go. Big big 12 <laughs> afternoon, pack 12 after dark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so so – Oklahoma State, yes, was impressive last week against Pitt. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out whether Pitt is a contender or any in any way in in the ACC. I don't think so, but no. you know, I, I mean, they got in level twice. But um, Mason Mason Rudolph has done exactly, and we talked about this in in the first week of the season that we thought that if there's a team that had the chance of running the table in the Big Twelve, it was Oklahoma State. So far, they have performed. We've obviously both been pleasantly well. You haven't been pleasantly surprised, but we've both been surprised by Oklahoma. Um, being able to, to rebound, but Oklahoma State some has... Is, some is more surprised than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's very true. <laughs> um, and you get to witness it firsthand, I'm sorry. <sighs> um, so... So Oklahoma State has done what it's what we everybody thought it was going to do in the first couple of weeks. Um, Mason Rudolph is just I mean it's like the the fun and gun all over again, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean Mason Rudolph just slings the ball down the field and you know he just 
hope somebody gets under it to catch it. And that so far the season, it has worked. It's working, um, yeah. the, the fact that Rudolph already has over 1,100 yards passing in the first three weeks shows you what kind, you know, what kind of offense they are. They don't really run a lot. I mean, it's it's two to one. Um, the numbers are it's 400 to 200 um, with 600 yards total offense um, for for the Cowboys this year. So the big question in this game, and it's worth noting, this game is being played um, in Stillwater. Mm-hmm. So. It, the, the big question in this game is whether or not the TCU defense is up for the task um, and, and whether or not it can get to, to Rudolph and force him to make some throws that, you know, he might not necessarily have made earlier this year against different defenses. Um, the second question in that game is that can TCU actually keep up um, with the offense? TCU has had a nice early offensive pr- you know, production. They've been averaging 49 points per game. Oklahoma State's been averaging 54. So on paper, it looks like they can, but they've not played a caliber team like Oklahoma State. So um, the other thing there is that it's that TCU is is more pass run balanced. Yeah. Um, and, and Oklahoma State has done a nice job of stopping the run. They held Pitt last week to just over 100 yards between four different backs. So um, and actually, it, and and one of the better scoring defenses in the country so far. Yeah, they are. Season. Um, and, and especially if, if they can figure out a way to, to contain at least one aspect of TCU's offense and make them a one-dimensional team, um, I, I, I think Oklahoma State is the pick in this one. I just feel like they're the more well-rounded team. Um, but that TCU defense, I mean, if they can figure out a way to pressure Randolph and, and force him to make some, you know, force him into turnovers, which he hasn't done much this year, is 11 touchdowns, one interception. Um, if they can figure out a way to force him to make a couple of mistakes, then I think this game could be relatively close. But, um, but I think right now Oklahoma State's the more well-rounded off, not well-rounded offense, but they have the better offensive production. They've got the better defense to slow down TCU. Um, I think Oklahoma State is the pick in this one. Okay, I mean it's it's interesting to to mention defense because that is the sort of the last thing you think about uh, when right. you think about Oklahoma State or and, and TCU actually. And TCU. Yeah. Um, and you know the the. I, you wouldn't actually expect uh, Oklahoma State to have to worry about defense until they're they're playing in in the uh, resurrected Big Twelve championship game, which I I expect them to to, to reach. Um, or Bedlam. Or uh, yeah, well, yeah, there is that game too. There, that that one might be important at some point. Yeah. Um, but but I, you know uh, you know they're scoring fifty four a game. Uh, they're, they're the seventh in the country in passing yards per game. Uh, it's uh, I think Mason Rudolph. This would be uh, game number four. He will probably hit twelve hundred yards passing on the season. You know before Oklahoma State's first possession uh, is done on Saturday. So that's yeah. you know that's a decent start. That's a decent start. Um, but you do have to talk about uh, uh, defense in this game because uh, TCU has an offense that that matches. Although if if you're if you're involved in a shootout uh, and and TCU, you look at the balance that they have and, and that they rely on the run a little bit longer, a little bit uh, to a little bit greater degree, mm-hmm. that might work against them. Um, yeah. Uh, even and that even, that's even before you take into account the fact that, that Oklahoma State has pretty good defense. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, I, I think those two factors: uh, solid defense uh, for the Cowboys, un- unbelievable offense from what we've seen so far. Um, and of course, I, I picked the Cowboys to make the playoffs, so I kind of have to pick them to win this one. But I think this one, they're going to win pretty. Um, they're going to win this one fairly easily. I think this is a this is going to be kind of a statement thing for them as they as they get into the conference season. Uh, next up, we have the Bulldog Bowl. How is it? Okay, I wasn't going to do this, but I, how is it that there are two schools in the same conference that that have uh, the nickname Bulldogs? I don't I don't know. And two in the same conference that have nickname Tigers. I don't know how this works. Um, I, okay, you know, maybe the SEC, not quite known for the academics at, at some other conferences have. I, I, someone wasn't thinking about this stuff. But anyway, we have number 17, Mississippi State, at number 11, Georgia, the Bulldogs on the Bulldogs. Uh, Georgia is favored. The Georgia Bulldogs are favored by five. Um, but, boy, it, it's – I would I would think, um, you know, outside of the guys who are sitting at number one, the, the hot – team in that conference right now might be Mississippi State. What do you think about this game? Yeah, that's that's a you can make that argument. Um especially after that was another game that were kind of flew by in passing last week was Mississippi State LSU. Yep. Um and I, it, we watched a little bit of that game and first of all, yes, the the cowbells and the keys are obnoxious um in Starkville. <sighs> um but they ha- the Bulldog fan- Mississippi State fans had had great reason to be do you know to be making lots of noise in the stands mm-hmm. because that was an impressive win over LSU. 
Um, and I think what was the most interesting part of that game is the fact that this is a Mississippi State team that went out and physically dominated an LSU team that is known traditionally, LSU is traditionally known as a physical team. They're a physical yeah. ground and pound, you know, win this through the ground attack. And Mississippi State just kind of gave it back to them. Mm-hmm. Should we say hi to Should we say hi to the new kitten? Okay. Um, I, I I apologize for interruption, but she was wandering around in here, and I. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that she's small enough to actually do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna get her real quick so you get a look. Um, Everybody, really quickly, say hi to Cookie. This is Cookie. She just came with us home with us last weekend. This is Cookie's internet, not her internet debut, her, her internet video debut. Hey kid. Okay, I'm just gonna let her go do her thing. Do her thing. Um, so now which we're the may Carla just be and crappy and and Charlie and Cookie show. And Charlie and Cookie show. Uh, C-N-C-N-C-N-C. We're gonna need we're gonna need a whole new set of T-shirts or something. Um, <laughs> apologize for the interruption. Go, That's okay. Just, it was go adorable. ahead. You know, sometimes college football needs kittens. Yes. <laughs> Better than Bulldogs. I think. <laughs> it's better than Bulldogs. No. Um, okay, so where were we? Mississippi State. Yeah, so so it, it, Mississippi State physically dominated LSU last week, which was impressive. Yeah. Um, and Nick Fitzgerald has really kind of found himself there at, at Mississippi State. I mean, what a, what a week for him. You know, two touchdowns um, through the air, two touchdowns on the ground. He's turned into quite the dual threat quarterback. You put pair him with Aris Williams, who had, you know, nearly 150 yards rushing on his own. That was a really impressive performance. Um by Mississippi State. And so there's a there's a small part of this that is like how much of that was Mississippi State and how much was the fact that LSU really shot itself in the foot. Um because they had two players they had two defensive players ejected for targeting yeah. during that game. And that did impact the game because that was, you know, a couple of, of, of substantial players for them. But I I still think Mississippi State is the real deal. I, I don't I do think that impacted the game. I don't think it impacted the outcome of the game. Um, Georgia, on the other hand, has suddenly become our darlings in the SEC East because we're just hoping that somebody can show some signs of life on offense in the SEC East at this point. Um, and and remarkably, Nick Nick or I'm sorry, Jake Fromm has done that. Um, you know, going up and, and winning that game at South Bend um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. against Notre Dame, which was an impressive win for a freshman. Um, good news for Georgia is the fact that they they sat out Sony Michelle last week at running back um, because they're playing Samford and obviously they didn't think they were going to need him and they didn't. Right. Um, they so did. they rested him. He he tweaked his ankle. He's been practicing all week this week. Should be there, which means that, that Georgia will have its full complement of running backs going up against this Mississippi State defense. Um, interesting because Georgia is is very much run first, um, and and Mississippi State has a ridiculous front seven. Um, that can stop the run. So when you put those two things together, it's really going to come down to whether Georgia's defense can stop Nick Fitzgerald. Um, and at this point in the season, as much as I really, really want Georgia to kind of take hold of the East because that division desperately needs life, um, I think <laughs> I think Mississippi State is the hot team right now. I think they're the pick in this game, even though they're going on the road now. I do think I think the line is way off. Um, I I don't think it's going to be a blowout either way. I, I I don't know. I just feel like five points. It's I think it's going to come down to to a, to to a kick. I mean, really, I think it's only going to be like a three point game i i it's gonna come down to the waning minutes i don't think either team's gonna pull away um this is gonna be one heck of a football game and i mean who had this game circled at the beginning of the year uh i would venture to say virtually no one um and you know you uh you you expect kind of solid things from georgia certainly but but mississippi state and where you know who knows where that came from i'm going to move move right. you so you stay off of the keyboard um <laughs> I, the the thing that was so impressive uh, about uh, about Mississippi State and LSU was, uh, and you mentioned uh, Mississippi State's front seven, um, uh-huh. it, uh, but but the offensive line play also that was that is a big, fast both both sides of the ball, um, big, fast, physical uh, yeah. a, a presence, and that's man, that's uh, that's how you beat an LSU. Um, and that's how you beat a Georgia, uh, particularly uh, if you can. Uh, you, you were you were looking at, at Georgia getting the next Fitzgerald. Um, if you think about you know maybe Mississippi State getting to a freshman quarterback uh, and and shaking him up a little bit, um, especially geez if you can do that to him in Athens, uh, that's that's a that's an accomplishment. And I'm 
I, I, I was really impressed with Mississippi State uh, from from what I saw and, and what I've uh, what I've read since. I, I'm I'm going to stick with with those Bulldogs uh, over the Georgia Bulldogs uh, this weekend and and, uh, and and look for them to uh, to you know, see what this else they can do as they go through the um, the SEC West. Uh, the Big Ten conference season also kind of gets gets uh, really going this weekend, uh, and there aren't any top twenty five on top twenty five games, but there are two really interesting games uh, on the schedule nonetheless, and um, we're, we're going to take kind of a different approach with these. Uh, number eight, Michigan is playing at Purdue. Michigan is favored by 10. Hi, Charlie. Um, number four, Penn State is at Iowa. This is a night game, and Penn State is favored by 12. Rather than picking these games, Carla, uh-huh. um, let's, let's answer this question. Who has a better chance of winning, Purdue or Iowa? What do you think? When, when you came up with the idea of, of posing it this way, I really had to think. I mean, like, really, yeah, really yeah. kind of go through this because as a, as a Penn State fan, this game at Iowa at night makes me incredibly nervous uh-huh. um, because there's, there's a history here, right? Like, mm-hmm. Iowa, Iowa games at home at night are a ridiculous environment. It's the first time that this Penn State team is going to be going on the road and, and facing an environment like that, and is it ready? Yep. That being said, and while I am very nervous about the game, and I think that the line is off, I think it's going to be way closer than what the line says, even though I think Penn State's the better team here. Sure. I, th- I, I, I just think, I think that's going to be way closer than 10. Um, I still am, and maybe it's wishful thinking by my, by my part, but – when I look at these two matchups, I think Purdue has the better chance okay. of winning here. And and the reason why is because Purdue is – you could make an argument that Purdue is one of the hotter teams in the Big Ten right now, just like we made the argument that Mississippi State is is a hot team. You could. And, and, it's, un, and it's unexpected. You know, thank you thank you to Jeff Brom and, and bringing some life into that program that really needed it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um this is a, a Purdue team that gave Louisville a run for its money in week one. We talked about that, about how, you know, I was pulling for Purdue to win that game just because um, it was fun to see them being competitive on a national stage. Um, they're, pl- they're playing at home also, and it's homecoming, which is an interesting mm-hmm. wrinkle in the whole thing. Um, and this is a, a Michigan team that, yes, this is a Michigan team that is good. We saw that against Florida. But it's also a Michigan offense that really hasn't kind of found its stride yet. Um, yeah, it's just it's it, it feels so Harbaugh, right? Like <laughs> it's right? Yes. They, they've been in the, they've been in the red zone ten times this year, and they've only scored one offensive touchdown, one offensive touchdown in the red zone for the entire season so far. And they and eight they've made eight of nine kicks. So they get into the red zone, and their offense just starts falling flat. And the offense has only scored five of the team's nine touchdowns so far this year. And Yes, Michigan played Florida, but the last two games, not so much. Um, and so that raises some red flags here on about the Michigan offense. Like, will it settle down and kind of figure things out? Um, the one thing Michigan does have going for it is its defense is excellent. Um, but last week it played a run-first team in Air Force. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they're facing a Purdue team that seems to be – that's more pass-oriented. They're third in the conference in passing, and they've got 10 touchdowns in the red zone. So this is an offense that's really kind of finding its rhythm – with with Jeff Brom and a Michigan team that you know if it makes a couple of mistakes it could find itself in a dogfight here um and so do I think Purdue's gonna win the game I I don't think so but, but that was not the question but that wasn't the question right I, I think <laughs> Purdue I think Purdue has the better shot between Purdue and Iowa in winning at home I just think that I think that's a I think Michigan's an interesting matchup for them and I think they could in theory pull it off okay Okay, I, 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 for the for the same reasons you just talked about. I mean, the, the Louisville game. Um, I, I watched the entire uh, Purdue OU game. Obviously, you know my Bobcats are, are, are playing. Yeah. Um, we're playing at West Lafayette, uh, and that's. I mean, o, OU does not have a. That, that's a. They say solid Mac program, and 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 they destroyed Purdue. Kansas last week. And then uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, and then um, and then what you know what what Purdue did with Missouri uh, last yeah. weekend. That certainly turned some heads uh, against an SEC opponent. Um, I, it, it, and it's uh, you're, you're right about Michigan's offense. You wonder, uh, you know, if uh, you know if Purdue's a, a you know kind of uh, jacked up for this game as they will be, and 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 Wilton Spate has not looked 
uh, like uh, like a, a quarterback who, who can put up a lot of points. If they need to do that, um, and geez, they only they only put up you know in the mid twenties against Air Force a week ago. Right. Um, they they could be in a tough spot. But uh, Michigan's defense, uh, geez, that's that's a, a, a difficult thing to handle uh, for for uh, anybody. Um, and and I think that's that's maybe where uh, I, I I look at at what happens with that game and thinks you know it, how much does Michigan need to score um, if, right. if Michigan's defense is playing really well. Um, Iowa, uh, Iowa does not have the resume that Purdue has so far, which is an interesting yeah. thing to say. Um, you know, they they were in a shootout against Iowa State, their in-state rival. Um, they won their other two, other two games, so you know, decent resume so far, three and zero. Um, and and really, the the thing that I look at, and, and this is, geez, this is just a gut thing uh, on my part. Um, they they you know maybe you have a chip on your shoulder if you're the Iowa Hawkeyes because you play in the Big Ten West and. Uh, you know, everyone just assumes Wisconsin is is the presumptive favorite there. That's it's just uh, how that's going to be. Um, but you know, you look at, at how things are setting up, and um, you know, you'll have your shot at Wisconsin, and, and Nebraska is apparently going to be down this year. So, you know, you got, maybe you got a shot in the West. The other reason you have a chip on your shoulder uh, for this weekend in particular is a uh, Penn State forty one, Iowa fourteen. Yeah. Um, that's that's what happened in Happy Valley last year. Uh, revenge is a powerful motivator, and you know, and and, and again, this, this is you, you mentioned Iowa. Iowa City is not that that that's is that is a tough place to play um, under any circumstances. But a night game, uh, a game where everybody wants a little blood because of what happened a year ago. Um, I, I'm I'm not you know you, you can't you can't say that it's I'm not going to say that that, that I was going to win this game, but I I think. Uh, particularly if Penn State shows up and and maybe you know is uh, kind of looking past this one a little bit, um, they could be in for a, they could they could have their hands full, um, and that's a I, I could I could see Iowa uh, coming away with an upset in this game. Um, I don't. Okay. <laughs> and that's and that's totally fair. Um, uh, and you know we can we'll we'll get back to discussions about revenge uh, perhaps more towards the end of October and. Um, I, I, I keep referencing this stuff, and, and, and man, I'm looking forward to that game. Uh, <laughs> but I've got, I, you know, my, my Buckeyes have a long way to go before they're ready to play that one. Uh, and fortunately, we have this weekend and several more weekends before that comes up. Um, Carla, enjoy the games this weekend. I will. You too. I will. AG, thank you for your input. Uh, we will uh, hopefully we'll hear from you next week as well. And guys, thank you for watching. Um, enjoy the games, and uh, we will talk to you again next week. See you.